Hello, my name is Kate Hartman, and I will be the instructor of BS 110, Buddhism and Pilgrimage. Some of you may remember me from BS 101, Introduction to Buddhism, and I'm really excited to be back here with Yogic Studies teaching another course, especially one that's so close to my heart and my research interests. So in this video, I want to give you just a brief sense of who I am, what I study, why I'm excited to teach about pilgrimage, and what we'll be learning in this class. So to start, I am the Assistant Professor of Buddhist Studies at the University of Wyoming. I teach courses in the history and philosophy of Buddhism and other Asian religions. Uh, I got started studying Buddhism as an undergrad at the University of Virginia. I took one class largely by chance and just took another and took another. And, you know, next thing you know, I'm here talking with you. I started studying Asian languages while an undergraduate, starting with Hindi and then moving to Tibetan and Sanskrit, which continue to be my main research languages. And I also started traveling to India, and I've spent about three years living in various places in Asia, including Buddhist monasteries in Zanskar, Tibetan Library of Works and Archives in Dharamsala, Rangjing Yeshe Institute in Nepal, and Sichuan University in Chengdu. And so I did my undergrad at UVA, master's at UChicago, and then PhD at Harvard University, where I graduated in spring of 2020. And that's actually where I met director of yogic studies, Seth Powell, who became a good friend. And I'm really excited to come here and participate once again in yogic studies. So my main research is on the intellectual history of holy mountains, intellectual history of pilgrimage to holy mountains in Tibet. So I study why Tibetans go on pilgrimage to holy mountains, how they understood these pilgrimages, I read the various genres in which they write about pilgrimage. That includes pilgrimage guides written for pilgrims, instructions about what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to not do on pilgrimage, philosophical debates about various aspects of the pilgrimage tradition, and pilgrim diaries written by pilgrims about their experiences. I did my PhD dissertation on this subject, and I have a forthcoming book from Oxford University Press also on this subject. It's called Making the Invisible Real, Practices of Seeing in Tibetan Pilgrimage. And we're actually going to get to read some bits of the book before it is available to the general public. So that's a very exciting aspect of why you should take the course. And the central question of that book project is, how do you learn to see a mountain as a divine mandala? Especially when, when you look at it with your ordinary eyes, it looks just like a pile of rocks and snow, an ordinary physical mountain. The Tibetan pilgrimage tradition poses a challenge to pilgrims in which you look at this sort of ordinary looking mountain, but the tradition claims that if you were to see it in its true nature, if you were to purify your perception, you would see that it's actually a divine palace, a mandala, or a tantric Buddha preaching at the center. Most people don't typically see it in this way, and that's why this is a really difficult challenge. But the goal is to learn to transform your perception, and so to see the pilgrimage place in its divine, purified, enlightened mode. And one of the reasons I'm really interested in this question is I think it connects with a fundamental argument in the Buddhist tradition. So the Buddha said that one of the reasons why we humans do bad stuff and why we suffer is that we fundamentally misperceive reality. We see the world in terms of what I want and what I need and what I like and what I don't like. And that leads to this distorted perception. And so the goal for Buddhism is to try to transform our outlook in order to see the world um, as it truly is, to live in a healthier, more compassionate way. And some scholars in the past have overlooked the study of pilgrimage in favor of studying meditation or in favor of studying philosophy. But I think that by studying pilgrimage, we can gain you know, a new perspective on these central questions of the Buddhist tradition and recognize how pilgrimage is an important part of Buddhist thought and practice. So let's turn to the course itself, what we'll be studying, how we'll be studying it. The course is structured in four modules over the course of four weeks. Each module will have a video like this one, a handout, some optional readings, and then an optional quiz to test your comprehension. We'll also have a weekly question and answer session. 
that is generated by your questions, both on our online course community and live in the session. We also know that not everyone can make these, so we'll record them for anyone who wants to view it at a later time. And then what we'll be studying in the class um, is the history of pilgrimage. And instead of doing it, you know, let's start 2,500 years ago and, and go according to the dates, I've structured it around a bunch of case studies or pilgrimage site visits as I'm thinking about them. So each week we'll visit two or three different sites, visit, um, I'll assign YouTube videos of people going there, lots of artwork to get us as close as possible to visiting these sites. And for each site that we visit, we'll learn about the history of that site, the practices that people do, and an interesting way in which it engages with the history of Buddhism. We'll take a variety of perspectives, sometimes being historians, sometimes being anthropologists, sometimes being textual scholars, um, just because I think that all of these different perspectives on all of these different sites are going to give us a rich, a rich picture of the diversity of Buddhist pilgrimage practices. So let's start with the first module. So the first module, we will start with the historically what seems to be the earliest Buddhist pilgrimage traditions. And that starts with a story from the Mahabharata Nibbana Sutta, in which the Buddha is about to die. He's been teaching for many, many years, and he is going to die. Understandably, his disciples are really upset. And his chief disciple, Ananda, goes up to the Buddha and says, what are we going to do without you? We're used to, when we have a question, we ask you. Um, we're used to seeing you. But when you're gone, what are, what are we going to do? And the Buddha tells Ananda that, you know, even the Buddha is impermanent. But when I'm gone, there are four sites that you can visit. And they're not the same as seeing the Buddha in the flesh, but they have traces of him. And these are the four sites uh, where the Buddha was born, Lumbini, where the Buddha got enlightened, Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha gave his first sermon, Sarnath, and where the Buddha died, uh, Kushinagar. <laughs> um, and so the Buddha tells Ananda that after the Buddha dies, you can go visit these sites and remember me there. And remembering me there, it's going to spark urgency to continue working hard in your studies. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the earliest pilgrimage sites um, memorialized in the Buddhist tradition, as well as some of the earliest art historical evidence for the types of pilgrimage these early communities did. In the second module, we're going to look at sites that are associated with a miraculous image, a story, you know, stories where an image appeared miraculously and became the center of a temple, or places that house relics, remnants of the Buddha that remained after he was cremated after his death. So in particular, we'll look at Wat Prathat Doi Suthep in Chiang Mai, the Temple of the Tooth in Kandy, Sri Lanka, and the Jokong in Lhasa, Tibet. We'll look at the stories of these relics and miraculous images and look at what Buddhists do to memorialize these important sites. Module three is holy mountains, so that's my territory. And we'll look at two different holy mountains and kind of compare contrast. So the first is Wu Tai Shan, located, located in modern day Shanxi province in China. And it's one of the four sacred mountains of China, and it's revered as home of Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom. It has some of the oldest surviving Buddhist temples, Chinese Buddhist temples, and lots of really gorgeous cave paintings. So we'll explore the legends of Wutai as well as some of those artistic representations. Then we'll look at Kailash uh, in Western Tibet. And this is considered by many Buddhists to be the worldly instantiation of the cosmic Mount Meru, said to be the center of the universe in Buddhist cosmology. Tibetan Buddhists in particular regard Kailash as the divine abode of Chakra Samvara. And as such, there's been a long pilgrimage tradition there. And so we're going to look more closely at that tradition and look at a particular pilgrim's diary and what he does when he goes to Kailash. Lastly, in module four, we'll look at pilgrimage and tourism in modernity. How are pilgrimage sites adapting and transforming in response to 
modernity, the growth of tourism, which is interestingly similar to pilgrimage, but also interestingly different, and the rise of environmental concerns and of political concerns. So the case studies will be looking at Bodh Gaya, the site of the Buddha's enlightenment. The site, interestingly enough, seems to have been lost to Buddhist memory after Buddhism dies out in India. It gets rediscovered, although we'll see that's a little debatable, it's rediscovered in the 19th century. And then there are long disputes over who has control over the site. And as it grows very popular, how that affects the people living around the site. Next, we'll look at Shikoku pilgrimage in Japan, which is a pilgrimage in which pilgrims visit 88 temples around an island. And we'll look at how this pilgrimage has transformed as it has been marketed as part of Japan's cultural heritage, but in a non-religious way, how it's transformed when it's marketed as this cultural heritage rather than as a religious site. And then last, we'll look at Amye Machen in modern day Qinghai province in China, which is historically an important mountain for Tibetan Buddhists. As the political situation of Tibetans in China um, is quite difficult and the religious activities of Tibetan pilgrims are restricted, we'll look at how Tibetan relationships with this mountain has been transformed and we'll read poetry about a pilgrimage to Amya Machen written by Tsering User, a Tibetan writer and political activist. So I hope students will walk away from the course with an understanding of these wonderful different pilgrimage sites um, and hopefully a list of places that maybe you'd like to visit someday. So thank you so much and I hope to see you in the class.